So welcome. This is a discussion about uh, smart cities and government uh, support. Um, at the outset, I want to say that we should really change the title here to just cities and government support, because the term smart cities is often associated with the digital world and how we just install Wi-Fi in all the post lamps and how do this type of things. And I think most of what we are going to talk about is more about sort of policies uh, that either cities or governments can do. Um, we have an illustrious team from various uh, angles, and I will uh, uh, let them introduce themselves in, in a, a minute. Uh, the structure of what we have is we'll have a short introduction uh, by us, basically presenting our perspective. And then I will have some very specific direct questions to our panelists. And then we will have ample time for discussion. And I'm really looking forward in the, in the tradition to uh, the discussions. OK, so let's uh, go ahead and start. Um, Allow me to uh, uh, introduce uh, Fabian uh, first on our list. Uh, Fabian is uh, coming from uh, France to us with a lot of experience. Oh, well, you can say that. Yeah, you can. Um, a lot of experience in various uh, roles. Uh, kindly introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I, I was very interested to listen to the previous panel uh, talking about. Uh, uh, multiple corporate venture funds. Uh, my, my past experience uh, is in the mobility area, being the head of strategy of SNCF, uh, the French railroad company, and having created two investment funds to invest in smart mobility projects. One of the investment funds was a multi-corporate fund. So much of what was said will resonate to me. Uh, I would be glad to share my experience. I'm now more involved in projects related to uh, smart cities, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm doing consulting on my own, and I'm also a senior advisor for EY, and I will share some of the work we've done together. Excellent. Great. Uh, since we lost Thanks, Paul. Alexandra, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Yasha. I'm Alexandra Maher. I work as a senior policy advisor to the UK government. Um, I work in the Inclusive Economy Unit, which is a cross-government unit that uh, sits alongside the Digital Economy Unit. And particularly, we focus on helping impact investors, uh, social enterprises, and what we call mission-led businesses to kind of thrive and address societal issues like financial inclusion, homelessness at scale. So we're a bit of an innovation team at the, at the heart of government. I suppose where I'm here because of that nexus, which you would have seen on this little handout between corporate venturing and some of the trends there and the um, trends that we see in impact investing. Excellent. Paul, introduce yourself for those of you who are not familiar with your... Thank you. I think I'm finally wired up now. That was, <laughs> that, that's been the most challenging part of this panel, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm Paul Morris. I spent most of my career almost 30 years, in fact, working for a large American corporation, Dow Chemical. Um, I spent the second half of that setting up and running their corporate VC unit that covered Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, um, based in, uh, in, in Switzerland at Dow's European headquarters. Um, that, uh, that, that unit I actually set up in 96 and ran for over 15 years. Since then, I've worked independently. So I, I work, I'm on the board or advisory board of couple of funds, uh, a publicly quoted company in Germany, and a couple of other uh, entities as well. But the bulk of my time at the moment, and for, for the last three years, has been spent advising the UK government's uh, Department for International Trade has a venture capital unit, and, and I advise that unit. So that unit exists to connect corporate VCs and VC funds from all around the world with UK companies that are looking for funding. So it's a matchmaking service um, that, that sort of understands, you know, my role is I work with investors, so I'm working with, in some cases, people I've known for many years, investors I've even co-invested with, and in other cases, you know, at events like this, of course, always making new contacts, understanding their investment scope, and then selectively connecting them with UK companies that meet that profile. And other colleagues on the ground in the UK identify the companies and help prepare the information. So it's... It's, it's, it drives inward investment into the UK, which is why the UK government supports it. Um, as part of that broad programme, we run specific pitching events, 
uh, showcases, uh, and we do that in collaboration with Silicon Valley Bank. So we run one a quarter in London, we choose a sector, we get 10 of the best UK companies in that sector to give short pitches, and then invite investors, it's invitation only, we get about 100 investors at each, at each event, and there's a lot of networking time for the investors to network amongst one another and with the companies. Excellent. Um, so I think that gives you a snapshot. Broad perspective. Um, allow me to um, introduce myself. Uh, can I get the, the website up and running? Okay, so I actually am the executive director of what is now called the Kohler Institute of Venture. This is a, a research center with the purpose of looking at the global venture ecosystem and actually coming up with ways to make it more efficient. Uh, we consider ourselves as a hub of knowledge. Uh, most of the knowledge that we um, collect comes from all over the world. Uh, the way we work, and it's a, it's a, a nice segue to the actual uh, topic of what we're trying to do here, is we identify particular topic, uh, what we call research strands. Research strands uh, like policy, as you can see, number one over there, history of venture, deep innovation, university venture, and the latest one, which is the topic of what we're trying to do now, is city ventures. And each of these things basically takes about, uh, I would say, three, three years. For one year, we sort of identify the issue and uh, talk to people and try to identify the, the, the key people in the field. Then we go through a whole process of fine tuning and developing a set of key papers in the field. And then we go out and, and push it out uh, to the world. Uh, we just came back from Hong Kong at the end tail of uh, our university. Uh, and that's how we develop our relationship uh, with this uh, illustrious team. Uh, and we are now starting to push out the results of the city venture, uh, which was a, a year-long effort to understand the relationship between cities and um, the venture in the ecosystem world. Um, the outcome of this work uh, is to be published. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we uh, go out. This is just a prototype that's coming up in, in a month or two. Uh, under the title of the self-sustaining city-state. Uh, we had a whole discussion, of, first, to define what is a city. I mean, is a small city, a uh, big city, etc. So we sort of find out a little bit of a definition on that. I would say that the problem that we identified as the key problem, the number one problem in this whole uh, story, um, let me just grab this. Is uh, what we call employment black holes. That's the major problem that we see. And what is this problem? With the story, simple story. I spend a lot of time in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is investing a lot of time in universities, in startups, in ecosystems, in training, in mentorships, in shows, in competition. And what happened? Very simple. You have winners, they take the money, they go to Shenzhen, and they open the company. That's it. It's very simple. So all the effort that was done to generate the stuff, what does it do? Contribute to the economy of uh, Shenzhen. And this is a huge problem today in a world that is very global. People are moving, capital is moving, etc. And all the investments that we make, which are trying to create local value, essentially do not create the local value at the end. An alternative to that, or another alternative story, is the work that uh, I did on the Israeli ecosystem, especially coming from the Defense Force. So the Israeli Defense uh, Ministry had the policy of actually not caring so much about the IP that comes from the defense directly from the army or from the intelligence force or from the companies that actually get uh, army contracts. They didn't care because they, the theory was that the companies will go out and, and there's going to be economical value to it. This does not happen anymore. In the last three or four years, what happened is that if you have a company that comes out of them directly, it's immediately being invested by the likes of Sequoia and moves out to San Francisco. Because San Francisco is what we call a, a giant uh, black hole. So we have some ideas about solving this, but that's sort of the problem uh, that we're trying to do. 
And with that, I uh, want to uh, direct that question from your perspective. Uh, how would you go about that uh, uh, from your, the, the things that uh, you're doing? Who wants to go first? Paul, go ahead. Um, I, I think if you, if you look at the program that, uh, I think there are different ways that governments look to support initiatives and keep, uh, keep the center of economic activity in their countries. And one of the ways is to throw a lot of money at it, you know. And you can argue whether, that's, whether that money is spent wisely or not, or invested wisely. And, and of course, you don't often see the results until several years later, by which time the government's changed and somebody else is in. So, you know, this, this thing has got a, uh, you know, self-perpetuating thing. But I think, I think the venture capital unit that I mentioned, I think is, is quite a, it's an acceptance by at least the UK government that we don't really understand venture capital. So we set up a specialist venture capital unit that can make, hopefully, additional funding available for UK startups. And one of the issues is the VC industry. I mean, look at investments in the VC industry. And if you track over many years, the whole of Europe put together is about 20% of the US total VC investment. And the UK, of course, is a subset of that 20%. So you know, companies get they raise a bit of money and then they get sold or they go public when they've got three million of revenues, which is clearly not the right time for that. So, you know, how can you bring more funding available? Now, you could, you could try and make UK funds be a lot bigger, but that's, that's, that's not so easy without chucking a load of, of government money in. So, you know, there's, there's, if you say that the total VC industry, the total investments is around $100 billion, you know, and three billion of that is in the UK. There's 97 billion around the rest of the world. So how can you tap into some small part of that to encourage corporate VCs and VC funds to put money into good UK startups mm. and help them grow? And if they can get funding, maybe they can stay in the UK. Mm -hmm. And yes, they can partner with their friends in Shenzhen and yep. they can do business there and they can help them. I mean, I work with some corporate VCs and VC funds in China um, who are invest interested in investing in the UK, but that doesn't mean you know, I don't think we should be too parochial. It doesn't mean that they're, they're, they want to steal everything and take it back to China or anything. Like that. Mm -hmm. So, so I think um, you know that's a way of, of of connecting UK companies with with investors globally, particularly corporates who, of course, bring more than just cash or potentially more than just cash, and, and helping those companies grow and hope. And you know, what we would hope is that they remain in the UK. Interesting, Fabian. Yeah, I think. Um what came clear to, to me and to, to us as we were working on these two projects, the Smart Cities um, project with EY and the other project on uh, new business models for parking, is that cities, government, do not speak the same language as corporate or startups. They do not communicate. They do not communicate. And I think we, we tried to, to break the ice by creating, by working around a concept that probably many of you know, but that uh, Michelin is pushing through its open lab approach, which was to create a community of interest. What is a community of interest? It is made of people, or let's say companies, coming from different horizons, but sharing the same interest to find solution to a given problem. The problem was new business models for urban parking. Constituencies to the open community were four cities, Paris, Lyon, Orléans, and Chartres. Five to 10, I don't remember the number, of large corporate, GE, NG, uh, Parqueon, and people involved or not directly involved in the parking business. business, and a lot of startups. And what we did is we defined objectives. Um, we interact through three different ways, post uh, on the internet, face-to-face -face meeting, and global, large global meetings. And with this methodology and this willingness to come up with a common conclusion. We shared data, we put together a very complex metrics 
to project and, and anticipate what would be happening in the parking area of 10 years from now. But on the short term, we put together three, two scenarios. One scenario which was aimed at improving logistics in cities, so improving parking to improve logistics. Think of all these trucks being parked in the middle of the road to deliver one package, blocking all um, traffic and creating immense pollution and, and, and turmoil. So we put together a scenario, and now we have the city of Lyon, three corporate and three startups working together to find a ground for experimentation in the city of Lyon. So the name of the game is talk together and find concrete grounds for experimentation. So just to, to follow up on this thing, the value created for Lyon is saving or whatever, it's just piloting in that, but it's not necessarily that the jobs are going to be in Lyon. That's not important for Lyon yes, for now. Lyon will keep the jobs. Why will Lyon keep the jobs? Because they now have three startups mm -hmm. really involved okay. in promoting the solution. These startups happen to be funded by whichever, yeah. whomever VC okay. or a private fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but the startups are, are based in Lyon. Right. So, yeah, so basically, uh, the ability to do experimentation, the links with the town, municipality and the people allowed that thing yeah. to happen. Which was does it? not mean that these startups, and this is what is expected, are not going to grow yeah, and be maybe global. become global yep. and find global solution to solve problem, uh, parking problems. But b because they have this ground for experimentation, yes. and this is what is most important to them, they, they have some... Uh, Sounds like a plan, yeah. Uh, um, Heart, uh, heart uh, connection, connection. With, with Leon. Alexandra. Um, yeah, so I think kind of building on what's been said, if I think about my own experience in government where we've had the kind of the challenge was if, if your challenge is, um, you know, how do you encourage more VC uh, in, inward investment into the UK, our challenge kind of set by the uh, previous Prime Minister David Cameron was how do you build a social investment market? So how do you have social investors that are looking for social and environmental returns and also financial returns? I think the kind of short answer to your question is like, you've got to do, if you're a government, you've got to do lots of things um, and you've got to be a bit experimental about it. So um, we have, we often talk about keeping it really simple, kind of the three things you do is we've tried to drive supply of capital into the market. So we have a tax relief that incentivizes um, investment into, into social enterprises, which is similar to the ones that exist for um, venture, venture capital. <laughs> Um, we also set up a large institution called Big Society Capital that is, is kind of set up as a bit of a, a market maker and is meant to um, seed fund or cornerstone social investment funds across the UK. Um, but complementing that, if you're kind of encouraging more money to move in, we have done lots of capacity building programs as well. Um, so to try and build that pipeline of social enterprises. And some of uh, social enterprises or I guess what are increasingly often tech businesses, often startups that uh, will fall into the smart cities movement or will be in the ed tech or health tech space. And so we have um, the UK government seed funded kind of 10 uh, incubators across the UK that had a specific kind of social lens to them. Um, one of them here in London is called Bethnal Green Ventures and now kind of exists without UK governmental support. It's really very early stage ventures, kind of good ideas, really. But um, it's interesting that if you, if you come back to your initial challenge, kind of how do you, um, if government sees a problem that they want to be solved, uh, which, is, which is where we start, and how do you harness the forces of entrepreneurship um, and investment to solve that, kind of facilitating partnerships like we did through the incubator, which is similar to kind of what you've done, is, is way where government can kind of both give a bit of coverage saying, hey, we think this is a good idea and that um, moves people, other people into that space. Um, it's, it's, it's a space where government can be braver, I suppose, than um, other okay. actors. And the third thing, I suppose, will be money in, um, encouraging demand for that money, and then I suppose it's just the enabling environment. So I think the convening power of government to facilitate conversations, you know, whether they're at a G8 level around new areas of debate, um, really important. 
um, but also obviously government has a legislative power. So uh, looking at whether the, the rules and regulations allow or encourage what you want to happen um, mm. is probably the, the starting point for many governments. Excellent. I want to move to the second part where I ask specific questions, uh, which I've prepared very carefully by simply asking them what they want me to ask them. <laughs> so very efficient. I outsource the whole thing. Um, Paul, uh, you have a lot of experience in this field. You have done uh, many, many, many things. Uh, you are now the president of uh, Global Government Leadership Society. A, what it is, what, what the hell is that, and why do we need it? And B, how is that going to help the cities of the world to become more efficient? So um, I think if you, if you participate in a panel like this, you may like to think that the people have come to the conference to listen to your words of wisdom. But uh, actually, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, probably the, the real reason people come to the conference is, is to network. So the, 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 go the Government Venturing Leadership Society, which is a bit of a mouthful in itself, um, is, is basically uh, I think developing... it should be renamed Friends of Paul. That would be much more efficient well, naming. Well, I need more friends then. That's the message then. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a network. So corporates, you know, corporates tend to be global organizations that they look to invest globally. But do they have access to deal flow globally? Do they really understand what's going on in many different countries around the world? Yes, in the home country, and yes, in some others maybe where they've got people, but certainly not all over the world. On the other hand, you've got governments or agencies, government agencies in almost every country that has any ambitions to have VC investment or innovation that want to attract investment. So the whole idea of the society is to marry those two together, to create a network so that in every country there's a government or a government agency or somebody that's willing to share information about the opportunities in that country. Excellent. And uh, corporates, or, and not just corporates, can be VC funds as well, can tap into and connect with that. So, so that's, that's the idea, is to create this network. So I think you know, the message I'm trying to get across is whatever country you're from, if you want to be involved in that, if you're a leading corporate VC in your country, or if you're a government agency that wants to attract investment, we'd very much like you to get involved. Excellent, good. So I think that's a long enough answer without talking about cities, but it can benefit No, 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 it can, so because can, if yeah. you want to have so, new ideas, you yeah, approach yeah. it. And yeah. if you're a city leader dealing with venture, and many of them of are now have like innovation arms or something like that, they need a place to, to get ideas from, and not just Google things. It's, exactly. So I think that could be another, another interesting angle. Um, Fabian raised a very interesting question. Uh, how uh, do we make the citizens of the city more involved in this thing? And do we? And I'm adding, Yesh is adding, do we want that? So how do we make citizens more involved? Um, first of all, when, when asked the question uh, to French citizens, what do you expect uh, f from your city? What's a smart city from, a, from your point of view? There were three criteria or three items that came out. Innovation, the, the city has to be innovative. We mentioned that before. Uh, the city has to transform itself internally. Uh, so the, the administration has to be more efficient. Uh, and last but not least, it has to be an, a collaborative city. It has to be to foster um, initiatives that allows citizens to talk together more openly and to share point of views on different issues that are being proposed by the government of the city. So I think there is a real desire these days for more openness and sharing. This is the, the kind, I mean, the, the traditional sharing economy. I think citizens now want to be part of the decision that the government make from this for themselves and not just be at the end of, of the decision process and find themselves facing with what has been decided if they don't want it. So yes, there is a real need and a real demand for that. And what we, can, what we can see is that all those startups that rely on citizen information to provide and share information, think of Waze, the company that gives you the state of the traffic. Yes, Israeli company, thank so, you. 
okay? <laughs> Th this is one of the success stories of, of yes. the mobility world. Yes. So as soon as you try to involve more and yes. more people uh, and be Mobilis. more open and share data and share Excellent. information, you, may, you will make progress. I, I think this uh, is a fascinating point about um, the value of sharing economy. I, I, I want to add a tiny gossip uh, item. The initial users of Waze um, at some point sued them for actually not paying them <laughs> to give the data because they became such a big company mm -hmm. uh, and, and it really it started from them mm -hmm. giving the data and something in the agreement. And I think they, before Google bought them, mm -hmm. they sort of gave a little bit of money out to make sure everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one needs to manage that. Um, Alexander, I have two questions, one that I invented myself and one that you invented yourself. Uh, the one that you asked me is, what is the next frontier for government role in building social investment, which I think is a fascinating topic. But before that, please define for me, it will really help me personally, what is social investment? I have no idea. Sure. Um, well, I suppose from the, I mean, we take a pretty broad, uh, big tent approach to what is social investment. So it's really almost in the eyes of the investor. Are they looking for, are um, they intentionally seeking both kind of a social or environmental impact um, and a financial return in their investment? Um, it's much more an approach to investing necessarily than an asset class, though that is kind of an ongoing debate that goes on outside of um, government. Mm -hmm. I suppose from the government's perspective, we are, um, we don't actually, when we're pretty broad in our own approach, we've got um, some we have invested, say, in uh, the Dementia Discovery Fund, which is something that funded early stage dementia research with kind of seed funding from Department for Health, but brought in some of the major pharma companies. We would see that as a social investment or impact investment fund, a kind of blended fund from government. But on the other hand, um, there's also uh, big society capital that I mentioned before. A lot of its focus is on um, organization, uh, kind of much more in the charity, not-for-profit world, um, community-led organization. So there's kind of a spectrum of activity mm -hmm. there. Um, and it's still very early days, I suppose, in that approach. So we try to take a flexible um, yes. approach. Yes, I, I like that. Uh, in Israel, when you have a mess, it's, uh, they call it creative mess. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's it. Excellent. I, I, I wanted to add uh, uh, something that relates to uh, uh, cities and cities creating venture. Uh, from the work that we have done uh, when we looked around at interesting cases. And the, one of the most interesting cases is the city of Reno uh, in, in the US. So Reno uh, was a, a place of basically gambling. And uh, the, the, before that, it was a place for the gold diggers. So this area was, was very popular and then died when there were no more gold. And it was very popular with uh, gambling until Las Vegas basically conquered them, and they were really faced with a decline. It was the worst city in the U.S., and not a good good thing. And the uh, leaders of this uh, city, which is not a big city, by the way, uh, decided to strategically define themselves, I'm not sure if I'm using the right terminology, but they call, as the warehouse of Silicon Valley. That was the, the business definition of what they do. Namely, anything that is needed for the world economy that demand a lot of space. That was the physical thing. Mike fell. Okay, sorry. Okay, is it back, back, back? Yes. The, another startup is to fix this thing. <laughs> be good. Anyhow, the crux of the matter is that uh, Elon Musk came to them. Uh, it was at the time where they were very efficient in that. I think at the day where he came, they already gave him the license to dig up the mega factory. And the rest is history. I mean, the biggest factory in the world for lithium is, is in Reno. And that's not the only one. They have other uh, things like that that demand more space. And this, is, I think, is a wonderful example of selecting something that you can be good at, like a competitive advantage that will make you the best place in the world to be the back office of Silicon Valley. I mean, you need to be near Silicon Valley to be the back office of Silicon Valley. So that's one thing. You need a lot of space, and you need a government that actually gives away the land almost for free if you want to generate the jobs. And they have land, you know, ample land. So that would be uh, sort of my addition. 
Uh, with your permission, I would like to open up uh, for discussion. Uh, any interesting comments, questions, ideas that you think are extremely exciting? Or not so exciting? Depends. Yes, uh, we have a mic. Uh, so Just uh, name and... Gopi, Gopi Mattel. Um, I'm a director of the Founder Institute, uh, an accelerator in Silicon Valley. Um, one of our initiatives is the Smart City Initiative. We're organizing a, uh, a single day conference for that. And one question that comes up is, a lot of the problems for cities are similar from city to city. You know, sanitation, public health, safety, uh, parking, uh, you name it. And how do cities borrow from each other to be able to leverage innovations that are happening, even as the cities themselves are different? Mm, good question. Maybe Fabian, you have a? Well, th this, this is a point we looked at, uh, just focusing on French cities. Um, they don't share experience. <laughs> they just don't share experience. Um, because they, they, at, at the beginning, you, you have to remember that the, the main goal of a city government is to be re-elected. So most of the decisions are being driven by political concern. And not all political environment are the same from one city to the other. So it is not because one city implemented X, Y, Z, X uh, parking system that the next city, the city next door is going to do the same because maybe it is it could be in total contradiction with what citizens are expecting. So they, don't, they just don't share, and, and they are losing a lot of uh, information. But this, this is one very interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, uh, that obviously the, the political overlay of city leadership um, makes it challenging. I know that... Um, businesses, just from speaking to them, if they are trying to address one of those social challenges, uh, you know, their pitch to, to politicians is very much, this will make you win, but it's hard if um, they're kind of, it's a, that balance between a longer term return um, and the shorter term expectations of um, political timelines. I think there's an interesting role um, that for philanthropic foundations in that space. Kind of you see Bloomberg, Bloomberg uh, has a city initiative in the US yes. where they try to share a lot of um, stories across, uh, across cities of best experience. The World Economic Forum plays a good role as well as the OECD in doing that at a kind of national policy level because it's something that governments nationally um, struggle with as well. Uh, Australia, for example, has just introduced a kind of enterprise investment scheme pretty similar to the UK one, but it's 25 years um, after the UK one existed. Um, so there's, there is a role for kind of those supranational institutions and, and foundations, and I think a little bit the media as well um, to, to move into that space. I think the like Rockefeller Foundation, a big U US foundation, has um, funded various media institutes to kind of cover good good news stories rather than just negative news stories that, about um, cities or governments that are doing good things. Um, so that kind of thing is is one way of addressing it, and, and something I'd like to see more of. Yes, I, I wanted to add two things about that. Apropos what uh, you said, the OECD and the World Bank are collaborating on something which is called uh, the Innovation Policy Platform. Basically, uh, I think we just have it as an advertisement in our thing, so that's how I know about it. Uh, and it's basically a place where you can look in and what sort of cases and examples, etc., they, they have done uh, more on the national level. Yeah. Uh, the other thing which I wanted to mention is that I find it both in cities but, and also in universities, people like to learn, so they ask questions and what do you do, but they don't often understand the answers that they get. So if you go and ask Stanford, what are you doing? If you ask MIT, what are you doing? And you're a small university, the answers are completely irrelevant for you. Completely irrelevant. In fact, you will make mistakes if you want to emulate what they are doing. And the same for cities. Tel Aviv is Tel Aviv. And Haifa, who is 100 kilometers to the north, has tried to do an incubator. And they did an incubator. And they invested energy and space and mentors and the whole thing. And everything was just great. Everything was just wonderful. People did applications and this and that. And of course, the two top applications that won, what happened at the end? They moved to Tel Aviv. 
So what's the point? I mean, what, and I'm asking myself, I'm paying taxes. What's the point? What's the point of, of doing that if you don't fully understand? I think the venture ecosystem today is a very different one that used to be 10 or 20 years ago. And what worked v well, very well at that time from a local government point of view or a local city point of view is simply not working today anymore. We need something else. Uh, so I think it's not only an um, information gathering issue, it's information analysis issue. Or do you have the right people to understand the facts that you get? That's a, just a small take on, on that. Paul, anything? No, I, I think Fabian Alexander made some great points there. And I, I think, and to your point about people don't always understand the answers, keeping it very simple and short, um, you know, when decisions are politicized, all sorts of different influences can affect those decisions. So uh, generally, I think less government is better than more. <laughs> Okay, so, so less is more. I would actually would like to say exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. We need more government. The reason I'm saying this is because all of us are not uh, competing with each other. You know, Israel is not competing with the UK. If we let the case, then we let the other people. We compete with China. And in China, the government makes the decisions. And Singapore makes the decisions. And they, and they actually can make decisions. And they gamble in big ways on big bets. And that's how they conquer the world. Today, Tencent is better than Facebook. WeChat is better than WhatsApp because of the protectionism and the technology and the investment, etc. If you want to go and look at the next wave of digital technologies, you go to China. You don't go to the US anymore. You don't even go to Israel. Tencent 20, 20 years ago stole ICQ from Israel. They had the QQ. But since then, Israel is still in QQ, and they're already in WeChat. So I think the only mechanism, and frankly, this globalization is killing everything, if you think about it. The only entities that care about location are governments, because entrepreneurs don't care. They move out. VCs don't care. Limited partners don't care. They put the money all over the world. So who cares? Who's left? Only the governments. So the governments must act. Whether they can act is a different story. Uh, whether they can act effectively. That's another story. And um... I mean, the fact that, they, that the observation that we have now that most of them do not act efficiently does not mean necessarily that they should not act. And I think, you know, to take China and Singapore, these are very, very different political systems. Yes. You know, you, you, you can't, you know, we're talking about cities and that you can't revolutionize the whole political system you know to, to, to that end in, in, right. in the West so I think you've got to work with the system you've got and I think government I role think it fixes be... itself with Trump <laughs> we need we probably need another panel to discuss that but, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I think you know government's hands should be you know a light hand on the tiller direct you know encouraging you know mm. private players to go in the right direction yes. and maybe tax incentives work sometimes and that type of thing yes. but yes. Um, you, you, can, you can chuck a lot of money into things and actually get... Yeah, but I, I don't think yeah. it's about money. I think it's about policies. In fact, I don't think... I don't, the world does not need more money from governments. It's the right, I think I, it's I the right policies. That, yeah. it's, it's basically... I often talk about the, the visible hand should enable the invisible hand. So we'll, when you create markets, then you are able to create competition, etc., for the private sector to come up. Uh, I think that will be... a, a my hope, and, but that takes a really uh, a different level of leadership, I think, that is uh, still missing uh, among, uh, among all of us, I think. Yeah, but just one final, I mean, you can, you can talk about things, but actually putting them into practice is, is, is a challenge. So I think every, well, not every, but many of the states in the US have, have tried to replicate Silicon Valley. Yes. And if you look at the share that Silicon Valley holds of total UK VC investment, I think 10, 20 years ago, it was around 50%. What is it today? About 50, 52%, yes. at least it was when I last looked. So whatever the others have done, they haven't really eaten into the Silicon Valley yes. just because people get good at stuff and they, you know, yeah. they, they stay ahead. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Final comments, Fabian? Final comment. Um, a, a, a city with, a city needs innovation to attract, I mean, cities need to be in a position to attract entrepreneurs 
uh, to be dynamic, uh, to foster the growth in the future. So they have to find ways, and we mentioned some of them, uh, open data, ground for experimentation, and increase relationship, facilitate relationship between uh, academic R&D and uh, corporate. Excellent. Sandra? Uh, a building off what you guys were just talking about, I think sometimes in government we can be a little bit guilty of um, just talking about business as if it's one thing. Um, it's clearly not. There are businesses many different sizes, sectors, etc. I think that on the other side as well, it's worth thinking that government um, is not one, um, not always one institution that pushes in one day. The the role of government will be different very different depending on the level of government, depending on the sector, some of the urban innovation things where government has to act as a kind of procurer, I suppose, are, are very different from, from in other sectors. And, and going into any discussions you guys have with government with that um, basic but important to remember point can be, can be really helpful, I think. Yeah, um, on the Government Venturing Leadership Society, please get involved, let me know. <clears throat> and we talked about the importance of networking, and I think the next thing on the agenda is a networking break, so I think we should shut up and let people network. Uh, my point to you, a short story. I was uh, giving a talk for EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction Development, Budapest, and asked the uh, Minister of Economy a question, why would an entrepreneur stay in Budapest? And his answer was, it's a nice city. And when you have an answer like that, it means that you don't have an answer, really. So we need to look at real reasons why entrepreneurship should be in our city. Thank you very much. Thank you.